I'm always careful not to step in the plates as I come up. Don't want to disturb what you're uh, devoted to giving, and that's a good thing. I want to confess to you going in this morning that uh, we're going to talk about some things that I don't know everything about. Uh, I know that surprises you that I don't know everything, but uh, it didn't surprise my wife. <laughs> but I think it's helpful to realize that when we approach the book called the Revelation, and notice that it is not plural, it's just one, um, that there's so many ideas afloat until whatever a pastor decides to say about this book uh, will be vehemently debated by some and denounced by others and perhaps liked a little bit by a few. So I, I share with you this morning that I want to begin by introducing a portrait of, a, of the Lord Jesus Christ that is rarely read. That's in the first chapter of the book of Revelation. You turn there and let's read it together. Beginning with verse 9, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom uh, and perseverance, which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamon, to Thyatira, to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having uh, turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the, to the feet, and girded about his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were like uh, were white like white blood, uh, I, pardon me, I'm sorry about that, uh, like white wool, uh, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished brass when it has been made to glow in the furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the one living. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Therefore write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall take place after this, these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, that doesn't cost you anything. That's totally introductory. But I wanted you to hear again the portrait of Jesus after his resurrection. Sometimes we think of Jesus as being a 12-year-old lad uh, situated in the temple speaking to the elders and, and asking them questions that they could not answer. And sometimes we think about that image of Jesus as being the ongoing one, but the Bible indicates to us that this Lord who returned from the grave, this Lord who is alive forevermore, is the commander of his churches. And I think it's very important to remember that, that these messages that follow in the next two chapters in the Revelation were 
are addressed to real churches. I, I believe that's true. Some people take a different point of view, but uh, that's okay. You can be wrong if you want to be. Amen. Uh, but I, th I believe that these were actual churches in Asia Minor, and they had uh, great assets, and they had some serious liabilities. And I think that we can find ourselves in every one of them in some measure. Uh, though they may be typical of all churches, uh, I think that we can learn from the experience of our Lord and His message to us. What He does in addressing each of the seven churches is to introduce Himself by some of the material that He has already given us in His seven portrait. Uh, this was the way He appeared to John, and John described Him uh, in that first chapter. And though John saw with awe and such respect that he could not look upon him, uh, that he fell to his face like he was dead. And our Lord, in his grace, touched him with his right hand and said, Stop being afraid. Uh, and, and then he, he gave him assurance that, uh, that he is actually uh, the Lord Jesus, risen and with radiant power. The second chapter, beginning with verse 1, tells us a story about the Lord's evaluation of the church at Ephesus. It doesn't matter what we think or how we classify what we are, how, what our accomplishments are, what our assets are. What's important is what Jesus thinks. And so he gives us an analysis of that church, which had been a great church, uh, and it still had some of the residue of greatness. It still had some of the trappings of greatness. Uh, and he talks about those and commends uh, the church for those. A few years ago, I had a, a very dear friend who was a Bible scholar, which I never pretend to be who said what Jesus encountered from the Bible, from the, their Bible in his time, was the Old Testament, that he either commended it or he corrected it. And we find him doing the same thing in relation to his churches. And, and this is a case in point. So stay with me for the next few minutes, and I hope that we can uh, evaluate, understand, uh, and respond appropriately to what he has to say. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden candlesticks, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they're not. And you found them to be false. And you have perseverance, and have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore remember from where you have fallen, and repent, and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place, unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, having read a lot of scripture, I think it's appropriate that we talk to the Lord about this. What do you think? Our Father, we thank you for giving us the revelation. And we thank you for helping us to comprehend at least part of it. And we pray that in this direct address from the Lord Jesus to one and many of his churches that will listen carefully, that will attend.
adjust our lives to your will and leadership. That we'll rejoice because of the salvation that you've given us so willingly and freely. And that we'll treat with respect all those who belong to you. We pray that, that this lesson will penetrate to our very hearts. And that we'll become renewed in our faith and commitment. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus begins by commending his church. And you notice that the, the end of this lesson, which we'll probably refer to again, says, pay attention to what the Spirit says to his churches, plural. I see this as being more involved than simply these seven cities in Asia Minor that, uh, that produce gospel churches. I see this to mean that our Lord was speaking to you and me at White Avenue Baptist Church. And wherever God's people gather and assemble, that he's speaking to them as well. And that wherever God's people who are redeemed value their salvation in Christ, that we must listen carefully and respond appropriately and let God have his way in our hearts. The first thing he said that he committed in this church, this church that had been led by great people, this church that was begun more than likely by Paul, however, uh, he wrote to them instructing them uh, about others who were also leaders there. And they had a, a great list. We could go back the history of our church and, and recall the names of, of great men that have led this congregation in the years past. And we could say, why aren't we more? Why aren't we better? Why aren't we more obedient? Because of all these great leaders that we've had in the past. And I think that this is one thing that Jesus was saying to the church at Ephesus. He was saying that I commend you because of your works. And he mentioned this more than once. That there was a consistency and a dependability of, on the part of many people who were willing to strive, to work, to continue, to be faithful. Uh, and that is a good thing. The churches do not do well, they do not exist very long, unless somebody pays a price and works hard. So Jesus was saying to them, I commend you because of your works. And then he returns to it and he uses a different, a different word. He said, I commend you because of your labor, which suggests toil, heavy burdens lifted. That you not only work a little bit, but some of you work very, very hard. Uh, and you remain under the load regardless of what happens. And I commend you for that, that this is important uh, for you to remain faithful. And then he talks about there being willingness to suffer. Uh, is it appropriate? Is it called upon? Are we as believers? to take suffering with joy. And I believe that you'll discover as you read the scriptures with me that it's true that God expects us not only to remain through difficult times, but also to have joy in our hearts while we remain. Uh, that this is a commendable thing and, and the Lord Jesus is talking to them uh, and us about those who are willing to stay put regardless, even when it's extremely, extraordinarily difficult. Uh, that this is a commendable thing. That churches do not do well unless there are those who are willing to continue the toil and remain faithful regardless of what's going on around them. And then he uses another word that we have sometimes trivialize a great deal, and that's the word patience. But what the context suggests to us that what he's saying is your endurance, that you remain, that you 
are constant, that you never give up, uh, that you uh, continue doing what God wants you to do, uh, regardless of what is going on uh, otherwise. Your patience, meaning uh, that you never stop, uh, that you have a, a great commitment to the task, and you remain. Then he talks about they're having a holy intolerance. Almost wherever Paul ministered, uh, you could say sometimes the work of the Lord Jesus becomes discouraging, not because of him, but because of the way people respond. Wherever Paul went, there were those who followed him around and, and contaminated the message of the gospel by saying, you must do this, you must do this, you must do this. You must, in essence, become a Jew before you can be a, be a Christian. That unless you first commit yourself to being a Jew, that you can never be a Christian. And these false teachers who uh, tried to persuade people that they were sent directly from God, in other words, they presented themselves as being apostles, 